Uh, folks, I have often spoken about trailblazers on this podcast, but in most cases, those I talk about don't become leaders, uh, don't set a unique example, don't develop a style others emulate until they are well into their career. But that is not the case with my guest this week. She became a trailblazer as a very young woman, uh, never letting anyone, male or female, tell her what she couldn't do. Welcome, Beth Kochansky, better known to the world of professional wrestling as Beth Phoenix. Beth, welcome to Primetime. Hey, thanks, Sean. Thanks for the invitation. I actually am officially a Copeland now. So, you know, I, as, as difficult as it was to give up my Polish last name because yeah. I identify really strongly with my heritage, I am uh, I am Beth Copeland now. So I no longer have to spell my last name every time uh, somebody says it. <laughs> Well, I just want to make sure I said it correctly. Did I say it yes, right? Yes, you did. Right. Yes, okay. perfect. perfect. Yeah, All it's right. a little misleading with the I in there, and you did it perfect. Yeah, but uh, but anyway, I uh, I like the sound of Beth Copeland. I, yeah. I'm sure Adam does, too. <laughs> yes, it's nice. It, it was well, nice you know, uh, I, I want to uh, – yeah, go ahead. Oh, just to say it was nice to all have uh, – to, ha- to put on the um, – on our uh, return address envelopes, the Copelands. I thought that was really special. <laughs> <laughs> so you only need the one sticker now that you can yes. All, those, yeah. all right. Well, I want to get into uh, your your uh, the trail that you you blazed. But um, uh, lately, though, you know, and I and I hate to uh, uh, quote a, a bad Godfather movie because the first two were awesome, but Godfather three wasn't. Uh, it was okay, but there was a great line in there as Michael Corleone says, uh, "Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in." And <laughs> <laughs> is is uh is, is that kind of the way it went? Uh, recently or were you ready to uh, come back and do some more for the WWE? So it's really interesting. So at the time that I retired, um, my personal life was in a place where I was, you know, I wanted to start a family. I obviously had met a wonderful man that that had the same feelings as myself. And um, so, and I felt like at that time, you know, I was really frustrated with where um, the, the women were at um, from a company standpoint and um, the investment that was being made in us. So mm-hmm. I, I was kind of like, I felt in my heart, I had done my best and I'd try really hard um, to change things. But, you know, at, at some point I just got really frustrated and also all the travel, um, you know, I had been away from my family for a long time. Uh, you know, we buried both my grandparents, my, my uncle passed away after cancer and we just had, I had, I missed so many milestones in my family's lives that um, I just thought it was time to come home and be with them for a little bit and, and take a, a break from the road. And in that time, uh, Adam and I, you know, Adam's career as an actor was taking off. So um, I just, and I had had just had the baby, the first baby. So I just kind of took that supportive role at home and I loved it. I loved being a stay at home mom. Um, I kind of, uh, I followed wrestling but um, I had just kind of made peace with like, OK, that's that was my career. And um, I'm now a mom and I'm going to find other things to do with my life. I started I went back to school and I was pursuing um, becoming a, a therapist, which mm-hmm. I still I still am doing. But I had been doing that um, pretty full time after my second baby was born. So I was just kind of happy in my role. And then um, they had called me uh, about the Hall of Fame going into the WWE Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. And um and that was kind of the start of things. I wasn't really known during my time as a wrestler, and I was not inducted into the Hall of Fame for being a speaker. <laughs> so <laughs> I did most of my talking with my fists, and that was kind of what I was known for, like my real physical role. And so um, I think my Hall of Fame speech surprised people because I had the opportunity to kind of speak from the heart instead of like, you know, wrestling lines that were written for me. And um, I I think that that kind of um, opened a door for me in doing some more on air speaking roles with WWE. And it it started really slow. And I was like, I don't know if I have this in me or if I can possibly pull this off. But um, uh, Michael Cole and the announce team, Tom Phillip, everybody has just been so, so positive and um, really, you know, taking the time to help train me and um and just be there for me so this has kind of been a new opportunity that's opened up um that's been a a bit of a slow trickle to get me to where i am today yeah and and that's really amazing and we will talk about that that honor because uh you were the first of of a lot of things in that in that induction in uh, 2017 but um since we're on the subject though of being a, a commentator 
I, I find it interesting that you never really knew that you had that talent within you. Uh, you, you, you there were times you did have to cut promos. There were times you had to do uh, you know, talk on camera. But you never felt uh, you could sit at that, that table, uh, at the announce table, as though, uh, you know, we know a lot of it might be done in a booth or whatever. But did you, you never really had a, a clue that you had that talent. No, no, not at all. <laughs> so full transparency, um, you know, I... Like I said, I did, I'm not a confrontational person, as ironic as that is getting into the wrestling business, but I'm not, I'm not real argumentative. Um, you know, I, I, I'm just not the type that is going to go back and forth with you and be adversarial. So, um, you know, I wouldn't have made a great attorney and I'm sure I wouldn't, <laughs> you know, I was <laughs> sure before this opportunity that, oh, there's no way that I would ever be in a position where I could, you know, take on a role like that. But, mm. um, it was just, it's just been like a complete, um, it's been one of those things where I've had to just kind of commit myself and give myself up to the process and just try. And I fail all the time and I'm always making mistakes, but we learn each and every week and I'm learning to find my voice, like quite literally and figuratively yeah. and, and my place in the team, because, you know, being a color commentator, adding that um, analyst role is really different than being play by play. And they're completely two different animals, as you know, you know, right. and drive, driving traffic as a play by play guy, that is a big responsibility and a lot of work. And as a, as an analyst, my job is to take some of the burden off of the play by play announcer and then try to add a little bit of credibility from somebody that has experienced what's going on in the ring. So, um, yeah, it, it, it was definitely not something I ever thought I would. Uh, if you told me, you know, five years ago, I was going to be, you know, sitting alongside Morrow and Nigel McGuinness, you know, at NXT, I would have laughed yeah. at you. I've been like, no way. But uh, here I find myself and um, I'm just giving it my best. Yeah, well, obviously they, they like what they're hearing. And, uh, you know, it is a, it is a dance out there. And, and uh, God, I used to think just doing it with two people was hard. Now, uh, all those teams have, uh, you know, three and uh, you really have to know, you know, you have to, you're, it's timing. You got to be able to know when you can come in. You want to make, uh, have an impact. It, it is, it's, it's, uh, it is quite a learning process, but it's, it's awesome now that you've got another challenge that has come your way. And, and I'm sure that this training started, like you said, you got to be willing to fail. Uh, there's a lot of people that uh, maybe didn't face a lot of adversity going along their path and, and it's harder for them to do that. And, and they don't become as talented or as successful at it. But with that, taking you back and, and uh, folks, uh, you know, you grew up in Elmira, New York, uh, right? And, yes. Uh, yeah. And, and that's and I was born in Rochester, so I know the area pretty well. Uh, my yes. folks went to uh, Geneseo down, and, and my dad grew up in Mumford. So there's all these little towns there. And this uh, Elmira is kind of near Binghamton. Uh, but what was it like growing up in a town like that? In Elmira? Um, well, at the time that I grew up, um, our, so I, my parents, um, are all from Poland. I'm the first American born citizen in my family. And so my neighborhood was mostly Polish immigrants mm -hmm. and we had a, we had a Polish church, you know, and, um, then there was the Irish neighborhood and there was an Irish church and there was the Italian neighborhood and the Italian church. Mm -hmm. And it was like, we kind of settled, um, you know, the immigrants came kind of settled alongside folks that spoke the language and yeah. were familiar with the culture, you know. So it was kind of interesting. We had like different neighborhoods um, in Elmira, but it was a really small town. And um, I was I was pretty I had a beautiful upbringing, you know, before cell phones and Internet playing outside a lot. And uh, yeah. but yeah. one thing I can say about um, how my relationship with wrestling started is my grandparents didn't speak a lot of English. And one of the things that they found, you know, that they could really connect with was wrestling because it didn't really require you to understand the language to understand the product. You could be yeah. sitting there and enjoying it and enjoying, um, you know, the battle of good versus evil and the body language and the theater of it really told the story. So, you know, we kind of grew up with that uh, on the television in our household all the time because my grandparents could understand it. Like they could just yeah. turn it on and feel connected and feel an emotional, you know, roller coaster without struggling with the language barrier. And I think that's one of those things that when I've traveled with WWE internationally, that's one of those things that really touches me and rings true because it didn't matter what if we were in, you know, Italy or Spain or Japan, like we... 
the the theater of wrestling, you know, the sports entertainment brand always could could communicate with us, with our audience, no matter where we were. So I, 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 yeah, that really yeah. resonated with me as a um, as a young girl. And so in some ways, I mean, uh, without getting too deep, it's kind of an emotional connection for you to get interested in wrestling because it was something you were able to share with two people you really cared about. And it was that kind of the beginning that you did this together? 100%. Yep. Yeah. It was, yeah. it was something I enjoyed. I saw how excited my grandparents got my, you know, my little old grandma on the floor, like jumping up and down. Like she got really involved <laughs> in it. And just as a family, we only yeah. had one TV, you know, so we were all gathered in that room and we would eat and we would, you know, just have fun. It was a like it was some of my fondest memories was ru- running over to my grandparents house on the weekend to watch wrestling. And um, and, and yeah, it just it, it really brings families together. And I, again, I see that as a generational thing. Kids that grew up watching wrestling, then they have children and they bring their children to wrestling. And that's something they can share as a family and talk about and, you know, share their opinions about it, it, the same as is getting involved in any sport and, you know, loving football, the NFL or NBA, you know. Um, and I think that I think wrestling is really special because it has such like cool generational connections. Yeah, and there's also the story out there that uh, that your first connection with the WWE is you won a coloring contest. Is how did that come about? I guess you were you were pretty young then too. I was. I was yeah. 11, 11 years old, and um, there was our the Star Gazette, the Elmira newspaper, um, had had like a full page ad of the Undertaker with Paul Bear in it, and my family couldn't afford to buy me tickets, you know, to go see wrestling live, and I'd been begging and begging and begging, so I was like, I kind of took matters into my own hands, and I colored a this picture of Undertaker and Paul Bear, and I sent it in, <laughs> and I. I spent hours on this stinking yeah. thing. I shaded it. You know, it was like, it was like my life's wow. investment, the Mona Lisa. And, um, yeah. And then lo and behold, I think they chose like 10 or 12 kids or something. And I got a big envelope in the mail with my photo returned and, you know, a letter of congratulations and four tickets to, to a Monday night raw taping in, um, Binghamton. Uh-huh. So that was my first experience going to a live, a live wrestling show it was in Binghamton. Yeah, see, folks, another talent. She's uh, Beth's also a, a, an artist. Give her a set of crayons, and I can't imagine what you could create. I can, I can't, I can't speak <laughs> to the quality, but uh, I could, well, I could hey, win a color contest. <laughs> that's right. You, you impress them enough. Uh, were you, were you a great athlete right off the bat? I mean, I, I know in high school we'll talk about that, but as a kid, uh, were you uh, recognized as an athlete really as a young, young kid? No, not at no? all. So. Uh, no, I was an overweight kid and um, I struggled with my weight. I struggled with some depression and stuff as a child. Um, I, I had a rough go those pre-teen, pre-teen years. Um, but I, uh, but that was the other thing. Like I felt like I really leaned on wrestling, um, for something to kind of take my mind off of it and give me something to feel inspired by. And I just kind of got lost in that, that product. For a long time when I was kind of like a lonely preteen feeling depressed and, and bullied at school and stuff like that. So anyways, um, I saw Bret Hart and Razor Ramon in Ico Pro commercials <laughs> and I, I saw them lifting weights and advertising, um, that forgotten protein powder, Ico Pro. And, yep. um, I got it in my head. I'm like, well, they're picking up weights and they're drinking protein powder. I guess that's my door. That's my way in. <laughs> you know, I gotta, yeah. I gotta start doing what Razor and Brett and Lex Luger are doing. So, um, I convinced my mom to help me uh, get a gym membership. It was like a summertime membership. It was like 99 bucks for three months, like over the summer. And, uh, I went to a really dingy local gym in Elmira. And, um, and that's where I started. I met a couple people that were lifting weights there and they saw this kind of pudgy teenage girl and they're like, well, what are you doing here? And I just wouldn't go away. And I kept coming back. And if, you know, a couple guys were doing a couple things, they would show me. And then, um, in the gym, there was also a stack of magazines, a, a muscle and fitness bodybuilding magazines. Mm-hmm. So they were like all old expired magazines. And I asked if I could have one. So like here and there, I saw Corey Everson. Like that was like the first woman that I saw that was like, Oh my yeah. Lord, this is Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman's yeah. alive. You know, like yeah. I'd never seen women like that other than Alundra Blaze, you know, Medusa. And so it was pretty yeah. cool. Um, 
it was cool that to get that little start as a young lady because it was a different world. And I also noticed, you know, that I was the only girl there. There wasn't a lot of other girls that had that interest at the time. Right. Well, and it's interesting though that the first two that really got your attention were, you know, Brett and, and, uh, Razor, uh, Scott, Scott Hall, uh, and that it wasn't, uh, a woman who, you know, there were some women in wrestling, but were you always, uh, feel like, well, I don't care if you're a man or a woman. I mean, if, if it's something I want to do, because that would certainly influence you, you know, throughout your life. Oh yeah. You know, um, obviously Sherry, any, any woman that took the microphone and had presence, you know, even yeah. like Sonny with the body Donna's, that was like the first, and I had seen Sonny was like the first woman when I had gone to one of the um, live events as a kid, the first woman I saw holding a microphone and commanding an audience. And like, you know, she was the one raising the heat at that time. Like, and wow, I was like, oh my Lord, this woman is pulling the strings. Like I didn't really comprehend why or how, but I'm like, I could just see that there was something there that I'm like, oh my gosh, what if you had a woman that could talk like that and could wrestle like the men, you know, could wrestle like mm -hmm. Chris Candido. And, um, it was just one of those things where, you know, and, and of course, Alundra Blaze, like she was just such a, um, so ahead of her time in so many ways and, and had kind of given us WWF viewers a tiny little taste of the Japanese women wrestling, you know, and, and brought over Aja Kong and Bull Nakano. And, and I saw things that I was like, holy crap. I knew that, I knew that that could be done. I just didn't know how, <laughs> you know, how, uh -huh. you know, that hadn't really been exposed up to that point. So, but I, you know, like most kids, I think of my generation, the men were heavily featured. The men were the superstars. And so, right. you know, growing up, it was the heart, it was the hearts for me. Heart Foundation, you know, Owen Hart was my favorite. I loved Crush, you know, I felt, especially later on in my career as I kind of developed into a, you know, I played that big woman role. I thought like he was somebody that I, I looked to for a little inspiration. Um, but yeah, I loved the million dollar man. I loved the macho man. Um, I think kids of my, my generation, um, really looked up to those superstars. Yeah. And so, uh, the story goes is that, that, that you thought that amateur wrestling would be a, a path, uh, you know, and, and a lot of, a lot of professional wrestlers do come from that world, but here you are a young girl. And when did you start thinking that? And then what are your options at this point? I mean, girls don't join the wrestling team. Yeah. And, and you know, once again, like we're speaking of, uh, Elmire, which is a, a, a small town, um, uh -huh. and you know, I had no connections to the pro wrestling business. I'm just basically a nobody, you know what I mean? Like, so I'm like, how am I going to, I don't know. And there's no book written on it, how to get in the pro wrestling business or uh -huh. one that I had had availability to. This is pre, pre Amazon prime. And, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, I mean, my logic was amateur means you're a beginner professional means you're a pro, right? So if I want to be a pro wrestler, uh -huh. I start as an amateur wrestler. So, I joined the boys wrestling team and at the, you know, it was, it was a really pivotal decision for me. I mean, I, I truly sucked on every level at it. Like I said, I was not an athlete from the start. It took a lot of time and work to start, you know, understanding, you know, body movement and, and how to, you know, control your opponent. And it just, I, I sucked right off the bat just to be totally honest, but you know, it was such a good lesson for me in what I was capable of and going outside the comfort zone and doing something scary to go after what I want. And I realized when when I made that choice and, you know, started finding my footing that I was like, all right, this is going to get me where I want to go, even if I'm not quite sure how. <laughs> but even but getting there, though, what is it like when you show up at the gym with the, the boys wrestling team and say, I want to join this team? What was the reaction to that? What, what, what did the coach say? There was some negative, some positive. My coach treated me so well. He did, he never for a second, um, you know, discredited me or treated me any different than the boys. And, and all the boys on my team were so, once, once they, once I showed up on day one, I think there was skepticism. Uh -huh. And then when I showed up on day two and day three and day four, then people started to be like, okay, all right. You know, she's, she's not here for attention. She's not here to, you know, um, for lack of a, for an insider wrestling term, like put herself over, you right. know, or find a boyfriend or whatever it was. Like she's here, <laughs> she's here because she likes this. And like I said, my genuine, 
yeah, I wanted to learn. My genuine thought was like, am I going to, and I had this, I've always had this philosophy in my life. Am I going to regret not trying this? Mm -hmm. And my answer was, yeah, I think I will look back and I will regret this, not trying this. And it was the same with pursuing WWE. I'm like, when I'm, you know, when I'm an old woman, I'm 110 and I'm looking back on my life. Am I going to be like, man, I wish I had tried that. So I was just willing to accept the failure and the criticism alongside the good stuff because I was just like, well, at least I'll know it's if it doesn't work out, I'll know that I tried. I did my best. Yeah. What was that coach's name? Because uh, people should know about good coaches uh, who, who recognize uh, young people. Uh, when they're Co- trying to accomplish something, because a lot of them, they're not as good. But what was his name or what is his name? That's a uh, coach Weber at Elmira Notre Dame High School. And a shout out to him, because yeah. Yeah. even as I began my uh, pro wrestling career, he followed me. He supported me. He was just he's such a great guy. And he was really in it to support the kids. He was just a fantastic coach. And I think he saw the leadership skills he could instill in his students, even if he didn't have a state champion that year, all those kids walked away feeling like they'd accomplished something and somebody cared about them. And it is important. That's what, that's what really matters. Yeah. That's what really matters here. A hundred percent. Yeah. So do you get a lot of attention though? When uh, you, you start, uh, you said you stuck around, you're on this team. Did it, did people must've started to take notice uh, that you were doing this? Um, Yes. So, when my high, my high school career as a, as an amateur wrestler, like I said, wasn't very successful. I, I wrestled one varsity match so that I was able to letter, get my varsity letter. Um, but then I started doing club wrestling, um, after I graduated and I worked with, I, I was a, a member of USA wrestling. So then I did a few, um, tournaments, amateur wrestling tournaments. And mm-hmm. I found, and luckily USA wrestling was trying to start, um, creating uh, wrestling weight classes for girls. So some of, some of the, um, tournaments at the time in the Northeast were, they had girls divisions, but mm-hmm. they just didn't have them at my weight class. Um, so being a heavier girl, a bigger girl, um, mm-hmm. there wasn't that much competition and the girls that were doing it were maybe a little young. They were younger than me, quite a bit younger. And so, um, like just beginning wrestling. And so I, I ended up doing really well against the girls and just kind of like pinning people super quick within like a few, you know, 20 seconds or so. And, um, so, you know, I had a coach approach me and said, you know, what, what club are you with? And I said, I just sign up for tournaments. I'm not with a club. I'm currently going to college in Buffalo, Canisius. And they're like, well, you know, you could, you could really pursue this and have a future. You could go, you know, get a scholarship to college, but all the colleges were in the Midwest, you know, that were like really these, these colleges that had real functioning female wrestling teams, um, and it had just started to break into the Olympics at that time, too, when I was in college. So I was like, man, that would be such a, a, a emotional change for me to, like, leave my family behind and move all the way to the Midwest. And and I also like my heart was in pro wrestling. So, you know, my my hope was that one day I could, you know, become a pro wrestler. Mm-hmm. And um, so I ended up making the choice to stay in at Canisius in Buffalo. And I did, I used to attend practices at uh, UB's wrestling um, practice. Like they'd have scrimmages and stuff like that. So sometimes I'd take the train out there and do a scrimmage with the men. But, um, but then I started, I made the decision that I was going to train as a pro wrestler about, you know, two years into college. And uh, so I left the amateur wrestling behind and started as, uh, as a pro. Yeah. And uh, obviously your, your ties are close to home. I think you initially wanted to go and train with, with Stu Hart, but, but uh, why didn't that happen? And then where did you decide to train and how did, how did that work? Well, once again, you know, if I had had my pick of any school to go to, obviously I would have been, you know, at Stu's school, which I think at the time uh, Bruce and Keith were, or maybe Ross and Keith were running the school, I think at that moment. Um, but, you know, financially, I just didn't have, I didn't have the coin and I had to stay close to home. And I had, and you know, my mom was adamant that I finish my education. So, you know, until I graduated from college and also I had, you know, a good chunk of loans following me. Um, so yeah. I had to finish school. And, um, and so that was a priority for me. So what I started doing was kind of learning as I went, like I would drive to Pittsburgh to work for T Ranchula 
And if I got there early enough, some of the guys would show me how to give a DDT or take a bump, you know, and I just kind of like learned as I went um, until uh, and this was all while I was moonlighting uh, as you know, I was moonlighting as a pro wrestler while in college. <laughs> and um, and then I started going to Ron Hutchison school in Toronto when I started formally getting trained. So when, at what point do you get uh where you're ready to really start to work, uh, you know, beside these spots you're doing and you're going to school. So when does it become really serious? So I graduated from, um, it's actually kind of a crazy story. I graduated from college and I had an opportunity to work for the uh, U S department of probation in Buffalo. I had a great job lined up uh-huh. and I kind and I kind of came to this crossroads. I had uh, entered a videotape into tough enough three and I kept making it through the rounds. I kept making the cuts mm. and I kept thinking to myself, like, so I, I'm working this job 40 hours a week, like with this career that I could have for the rest of my life with a, a great paying job, a federal job. And yeah. meanwhile, I, I start making the cut on my, you know, my side job of being a wrestler. Um, and then finally I made it to the top 25 of tough enough. And they sent, they called me personally, MTV called me and said, we'd like you to come all the way to Hollywood and, um, and come to be on our show, you know? And I was like, oh my God. So I went to my boss at the federal probation department and I said, listen, um, I have this opportunity. It's kind of a once in a lifetime thing. Can I have a couple days off to go out there? And my boss said, no. And he said, you don't, you haven't accrued the time. And if you do take the time, not only do we have to fire you, but we can't give you a good recommendation. And I was like, Oh snap. Okay. Wow. So I, I had like, Jeez. this. yeah, Thanks for squashing my dream. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that was policy, right? So yeah. this crossroads where I had to like choose, like, do I keep going on this like real life job or do I like forego everything and drown myself in student debt and, and just go off like a, you know, just basically like a starving artist and try this tough enough thing. And I chose to go to Hollywood. Mm. Um, so I fly all the way out there and um, we had to do a lot of medical testing, psychological testing. They're really careful who they pick as candidates. And um, I failed the, uh, the heart exam. It, oh. It's like the EKG or whatever. I failed the EKG. Yeah. And they had sent me to like Mount Sinai Hospital to get my heart checked or whatever. So I came back and then they had this big meeting with all the, the cast members and they're like, okay guys, tomorrow's the big day. Al Snow gave this big pep talk and they said, oh, Beth, you stay behind. And I was like, oh, okay. I was like, maybe because I missed the beginning of the meeting, they're mm-hmm. going to, uh, you know, fill me in or something. Yeah. And then Al Snow said, I'm sorry, we have to send you home. You failed oh, the EKG. Oh, God. And I was like, oh. what? So then I had this like horrible flight back all the way from the West Coast. That was my, you know, first flight ever all the way back home. I have no job, no nothing. You know, I, I feel like my hopes are dashed of ever working for WWE. I'm like, do I have a heart problem? Like what's going on? So yeah, yeah long story short, you know, I, I had, I had like a sinus arrhythmia, like on a regular heartbeat, which turns out to be normal, like for my body. It turns out it's not an, uh, something that impedes my physical activity, but they couldn't take the risk at that time. And anyways, long story short, I had to start from scratch and um, I decided I was going to go back to the Indies and just start again. And um, eventually I got Ron um, Hutchison kind of got me in with Kevin Kelly. This is a long story. Sorry. Yeah, no, I love it. <laughs> and uh, at WrestleMania 18, myself and Gail Kim, um, we we waited in line for a signing that Molly Holly and Hurricane did, and we gave Molly Holly a tape of myself <laughs> wrestling Gail. And then I'm thinking, like, you know, Gail's yeah. Earth to me. Uh, Molly has, like, this line of, you know, 500 people waiting for right. her. I'm like, Nobody no Nobody else way. had given them a tape. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, p- possibly not these two people that ended up becoming successful yeah. wrestlers. Yeah. But Wow. I thought, oh, you know, she'll probably throw it away or something like yeah. who knows. Like yeah. she, and then sure enough, she took it right backstage and her and Dr. Tom Pritchard watched that tape. And, uh, Dr. Tom brought myself, Gail Kim and Tracy Brooks in for a tryout in 2002. And they hired Gail on the spot and they said, you know, Beth, you're not quite what we need at the moment, but, uh, you know, keep, keep working at it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, then that's how my relationship with WWE began in Toronto at the Air Canada Center for that very first tryout. 
So it was it was pretty cool. Long story. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, but you know, Beth, what's awesome about it though, and, and I uh, hope people listening are, are uh, taking this in, is already at this point, it, it's not like you have little setbacks. You have like big ones. Here you have a job you think you're going out on. You take this huge risk, and then they just crush you again out there. You come back, and then you, I mean, that you, you just kept going. And so uh, clearly you had a vision that uh, nothing was going to stop you. Uh, so, but how did you keep going at that point? I, they'd say, ah, or was that enough inspiration to you to say, okay, I'm, I'm on to something here with these guys. I got, I'm in the, uh, at least I got a foot there in yes. that door. So part of it is not taking no for an answer. And another yeah. part of it is, is having wonderful people around that are trying to give back to the business by helping young people. So yeah. Molly stayed in touch with me and knew how hard, I think that maybe I, I reminded her a little of herself. You know, and so she really went out of her way every time WWE was anywhere within like a 10 hour driving radius. I was like, I will drive. I will drive. So yeah, I, I can. Yeah. So I, I continued. I worked for an insurance company and which was much more flexible. <laughs> and uh, I continued to drive to WWE as an extra. And I just showed up and I wouldn't go away. And every time I went, if I had five minutes in the ring, the, the Dudley boys would show me something. Eddie Guerrero would show me. You know, Chris Benoit got in the ring with me. Uh, you know, The Rock took time to like, you know, take me aside and, and just, you know, ask me who I was and and how what I thought of the business. Just I, I just couldn't believe how much how much I could scoop up, how much knowledge I could scoop just from those days as an extra. So like, you know, if I could give any advice to today's current extras, it's like, don't be shy. Don't hide in a corner. Don't be afraid. Like you have some of the greatest minds in the business that are just hang, you know, hanging around and would be happy to ask a question, answer a question or show you something, you know, take advantage of that. Because once I found out, you know, they, once I found out I could come back, I kept coming back <laughs> and kept yeah. bothering them, you know, and, and then, so long story short, um, Nick Densmore, who wrestled as Eugene with WWE, uh, was very close to Danny Davis and OVW, which was, um, NXT before NXT. OVW was like, uh, WWE's yeah, farm league, right. you know, FCW. Yeah. Yes, yes. So um, OVW was in Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky. And, and Nick Densmore said, look, I could maybe get you a tryout with Danny Davis, but you have to move to Kentucky. And, you know, I'd only lived in New York all my life. And I was like, whatever it takes at this point, you know, I'd graduated mm -hmm. college. You're all in. Yeah. I was just all in because, yeah. again, I thought if I don't do this now, I'm never going to do this. Right. I've already given up, you know, a, a future career and a wonderful career. My parents were beside themselves. They're like, what are you doing? With oh, your yeah. Life? What are they thinking? Yeah. Oh, they're thinking. And then my next thing was like, um, so I'm moving to Kentucky. Kentucky. <laughs> and, and, uh, I'm, I'm going to see their faces. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to pay to train and I'm also going to be a waitress working at Perkins. And so they're like, like I said, they're beside themselves. <laughs> what are you doing, Beth? Yeah. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so Nick got me an opportunity with Danny and I did like this 40 minute tryout where I was like in the ring and all the other wrestlers tagged in on me and I had to stand in the ring and wrestle everybody and not tag out. And uh -huh. Danny stood from his perch, which we called like the bird's eye, a hard cam. And he watched me just like, I kept, I would not go away. I would not give up. And, um, he just was so impressed by that, like heart that day that he, um, he said, I'd love to give you that opportunity to come train here with, with us at OVW. Wow. And so it began. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, for real. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, that that is amazing, though. You talk about uh, extra work and there's a lot of uh, a lot of men do the same thing. And you, you basically, folks, you know, you show up, you're not under contract or anything. If they use you, they, they pay you They if they don't. But uh, I, I just wonder what it was like for women at that point, because. Um, you know, the, the diva, uh, ranks had just really, uh, were, was just starting to really get going there. What was it like at that point in the WWE for women? Well, being a lady wrestler, as Natty and I affectionately call it, <laughs> was yeah. not, um, it was not the flavor of the month at that time. Now, yeah. don't get me wrong, the ladies were wrestling. However, it yes. wasn't like a coming from the indies type of thing. WWE wanted to do an in-house product. So they would hire models. And then teach them to wrestle. Yeah. So a lot of these women were just in the toughest spot ever. It's like, you know, like for myself, I can barely skate on ice. And then it's like, hey, Beth, here's a hockey stick. You know, now you play for the Penguins. <laughs> it's yeah, like, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Like you, yeah. you, you have to, and you have to do it on live television. It's just, it's a really tough spot they were put in. 
And so I, I feel for that generation really like kind of having to learn as they go is really tough. And myself, I had, you know, in years of independent experience where I failed in front of live crowds without the internet and YouTube, you know, this was like pre all of that. So if I had a bad match on the independence, you know, I learned from it and I took that with me. It wasn't like I had a bad match on raw because I, it's only my sixth match. You know what I mean? It was, um, it was, it was just a tough time for the women. So I feel for them. And also the brand was different. It was very sexualized. We were, had a relationship with Playboy. So, you know, a lot of the, a lot of our content was heavily leaning in favor of sexualizing and, a, a, you know, and putting the women in a, you know, a role that was centered around our looks. And, yeah. and I contended with, I, I found, I struggled with that. I struggled with that because I wanted to fit in. I wanted an opportunity. So I'm like, Maybe there's a way I could kind of be a hybrid in this. Maybe I could tweak a few things and, you know, um, start. I didn't wear makeup in the beginning when I started pro wrestling. You know, I, I was usually playing the heel and the bully. So I'm like, I don't need makeup. And then so when I got to OVW and I started kind of seeing the trends and the flavor, I'm like, well, I, I have to like shift a little bit to, to, to find a happy medium to get an opportunity and get in the door. So I had to learn how to use a curling yeah, iron. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, but you're right, though. That's really what it was like back then. And it was that way for a long time. Um, you know, not that it's that isn't the big part of it still today, but these women are just unbelievable performers now. Uh, but for you going to OBW and, and I mentioned FCW and uh, folks who aren't real familiar, that was it was, I guess, the best way to uh, describe is kind of like the triple A of baseball. You go and they have and you're basically uh, being groomed to come up and this is where they find their, their best players. And, but, uh, as a woman there, were, were, uh, you training right there beside the men? Did they, did they separate it? And how did, you know, how did it work at OBW? Cause I've never really heard about how that went for women. Yeah. So they had, um, different levels of classes. They had a beginner class. They had, um, intermediary class with Rip Rogers. Um, and then they had the contract class, quote unquote, which was, most of uh it was almost all WWE signees with a small group of us non signees that I feel Danny was kind of lobbying because he felt like we were really good and really supportive and also we were good hands for the signees. We were safe, um, you know, and we were good opponents for like, you know, at the time it was like Mickey James, Jillian Hall were the big signees and I could be an opponent for them. So they, they brought me into the, the, um, contract class, which was a privilege. And, mm -hmm. and in turn, I got to learn from Lance Storm and Al Snow, um, you know, Paul Heyman, and I got to participate in the television program, which was usually only reserved for contracted talent. But I think just everybody kind of saw some potential, potential in me and also consistency. So, and, and I learned, and Jim Cornette too worked with us quite a bit. So, you know, we yeah. just had a change of the guard while I was there. But, um, but yeah, all those names, like I got to learn from some of the greatest performers and minds in the business. And, um, it was such a special time too. We were, we were watching the main roster, which at the time was only Raw and SmackDown with a, with an eagle eye because we're like, okay, where can we fit in? And we as talent were trying to develop characters and gimmicks and some way to fit in so that, you know, we could be a part of, of everything. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, you said that uh, you were kind of the the your character was kind of the the bully, the tough girl. Um, did you was and I know China wasn't there at that time, but was she an influence on you on on, on how you you approached? Because uh, she really was one of the first who could cross that line that that uh, she could match up and go in the ring with men if they you know uh, was she an influence at all in, in your way of thinking at least of what you wanted to accomplish. Oh, heck yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, so when I when I first started training with Ron in Toronto, I went to wrestling school and I was like, I want to be basically I want to be a luchador. I want to do moonsaults. I want to do hurricane ranas. I want to do head scissors. <laughs> I want to do lucha style, like, you know, death defying wrestling. Well, when I did yeah. my first moonsault and like almost broke my ankle, I was like, huh, maybe <sighs> I'm not going to fare well at this. And also, as I kind of looked at the landscape of young ladies, I'm like, most of these girls are smaller than me. They can't base me for all this stuff that I want to do. Yeah. So, like, just kind of organically, I started becoming, like, you know, if you speak of of things in terms of, like, cheerleading, I was, like, the base of the pyramid, tossing the girl, <laughs> the lighter girls on the top. You know what I mean? And that was yeah. kind of 
Yeah. That was the dynamic I typically ended up in is, is me being the base. And, um, so that was really, um, that was kind of how my style developed and in a bully style punching, I typically played the heel because I didn't, you know, I, I didn't necessarily fit the mold of being like the cute poppy baby face. You know what I mean? So, um, I was comfortable in being the foil and being the bad guy. And, uh, and I, I owned that role. It was pretty fun. <laughs> Yeah, and and when you get a big break, then then you get a big break with with uh, breaking your jaw. Uh, how how much of a setback was that, and uh, and how did it happen? Oh yeah, that was so awful. So you know, I got oh. signed, and um, you know, I had um, was this two thousand four? I think when, when, uh, when um, this I broke my jaw in oh six. Oh six, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was signed in two thousand five. I broke my jaw in two thousand six. And, um, so yeah, I had just started this program. It was like surreal. I jumped, I was in the um, audience and I jumped the rail and attacked, uh, Mickey James. And I end up, I was supposed to be an ally of Trish because Trish had, um, injured. She had a dislocated shoulder. So she was out for a few weeks. They needed an opponent for Mickey. And I think that in, I think that in WWE's mind, I was going to be like an interim opponent until Trish was well. And then Mickey and Trish would pick up because they were, they were like in the heat of this awesome feud they were having. Yeah. So I was going to just fill the gap there until Trish was healthy, but I didn't care. Cause I was like, Oh my God, this is, it was just so surreal. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I had my first week on TV. Then I had a second week on TV and then it's like, Beth, you're going to, ha- I had a tag match, I think was like the third week. And then the, the fourth week or fifth week, I'd had some live event loops and I was in my glory. I'm like cutting promos. I was like, Oh my God, this is everything I've ever wanted. My dream has come true five weeks into my debut. And I have a singles match with Victoria and I, uh, everything was going to plan and I stand up and I took a slap just as we had uh, set up and um, I had my mouth open during the slap and I had been slapped a million times before that. I had never had, it was a bizarre, like just kismet type of thing. And my jaw, I heard a crack and uh, I felt a little woozy, but I was like, I put my tongue between my teeth and I was like, Ooh, I lost a tooth crap. Mm. I was like, Oh, well, I'm sure that's, and I had this whole thought process I'm sure that that will be easy to replace, you know, but I'm going to keep going. So we finished the match. And then um, after the bell, Trish, I was slow and kind of like clunky. You know, I wasn't reacting well because little did I know I was not loopy. And, uh, yeah. uh, you know, after the match, we had a moment where Trish was supposed to have my hand raised and we were supposed to look like victors. But I am like white as a ghost and there's blood trickling out of my mouth. And here's poor Trish in a sling. She's her, too. <laughs> And she's just telling me, she's like, it'll be okay. Smile, smile. It'll be okay. Like, she's just trying to talk me through this. That girl walked me to the back with one arm to put me in the trainer's room. And I'll never forget, I had like 25 people all around me in the trainer's room. Everyone's like, what happened? Nobody knew. I said, I got lost a tooth. And then the doctor opened my mouth and I saw everyone recoil like, oh, and that's when I knew it was bad. I was like, "Uh oh, (laughs) But I had like a dislocation and a break and my jaw was com- completely severed all the way through. And so they took they took me in an ambulance to UPMC and they couldn't get me into surgery until Wednesday. So from Monday night until Wednesday, I oh, had to lay God. in the hospital <laughs> with a messed up jaw. It was oh. it was horrible. So anyways. Well, in the, oh, no, but I, you, you said it was a slap. I mean, she must have laid it in. I mean, even with your mouth open, but it was just a, like a freak thing, the way it, that she caught yeah. you. I mean, we all slap. To make that yeah. noise, we all slap each other hard. But I yeah. think what happened was like the palm of her hand hit me a little bit under the jaw. So it was more, yeah. it was a little bit like, it was just, it was a little bit off. It was nobody's fault. You know what I mean? And we definitely, we had, that's something that we had both cleared with one another. So it was, I was there waiting for it, ready for it. And it was just a free thing. And the doctor told me it was like a boxer's fracture, like just a weird, my, you know, your top jaw bone hit your bottom jaw bone and just the right amount of force in the right place. And that's, that's what happened. So, um, but yeah, it was, um, but you know, I will say about that whole experience as, as much as like I did lay in that hospital bed and contemplate all, all of my life choices, but, but I do have to say two people called me that I won't forget. One was Stephanie McMahon called me to check on me. And the second person was Howard Finkel. And 
Howard Finkel is, he's just one of the sweetest, most wonderful people I've ever met through my whole career. I remember coming as an extra driving all the way to New Jersey and Howard took the time to talk to me and he said, well, Beth, one day I look forward to announcing your name in the ring and I'll never forget that. And I said, Howard, one day you will. And then we were at a pay-per-view and I was champion or something and Howard announced my name and he said, see Beth, he said, before he said, he said, see, I told you we'd be here. Yeah. And so I, I love Howard so much and he did call and check on me and, um, and yeah, and it was just one of those rebuilding experiences. It's like, you know, my, my spot on the main roster was not sitting there waiting for me when I was healed. I was surprised to find that, that like, Oh, Beth, sorry. You know, we've kind of moved on. We don't have space back for you. Back in right line. Now. Yeah. Yes. Back, totally back in line. And the landscape had been changing and I was like, Oh crap. I'm starting over and, and, you know, at the time they would clean house. They would release a bunch of people. And I, I know my list, my name was on that list once or twice. So it was a really scary moment for me because I was eyeballs deep in debt. All my student loan debt was accruing and accumulating and I'm, you know, waitressing to try to make ends meet. So it, it was definitely a, a tumultuous time in my life. Yeah, and that uh, recovery wasn't uh, anything uh, too easy. It wasn't just setting your job. I mean, didn't you have uh – a plate put in and, and I mean, it was a pretty involved uh, operation and recovery, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, um, it was pretty ugly. They had to bring in a, a special plastic surgeon and I have two large oh. plates and nine screws in my face. <laughs> but the, but the scariest thing of the process was when they finally got to me on Wednesday to give me the surgery, the doctor was like, I can't guarantee that we can do the surgery from the inside of your mouth. So we may have to cut you from the outside. Oh. And so I didn't know when I went to sleep, if I was going to wake up with a huge scar across my entire face, yeah. which, you know, it's, it is a superficial thing. But if you, at that time, when I wanted to be, you know, one of those flawless, impeccable divas, yeah. Yeah. I was like a six inch scar on my face is not going to be good. Right. So there was, just, there was a lot of like stress and pressure and they obviously they did all the surgery on the inside of my mouth. Thank God. So I don't have any visible scars, but I still have a lot of nerve damage and you know, I, I, I can't feel a lot of the skin on my you know face in that area and my lip. So it's, it's a reminder of, um, you know, that, that right. very big first experience. <laughs> yeah. And also part of the price you, you paid along the way. Uh, yeah, you said yeah, that totally. it, it was, it was, uh, yeah, but you, you said that, you know, here you are bouncing on an in and off the roster. You don't even know if you got a spot coming back. Uh, when did it change? And, and, the, and everything really did change at that point when you start, became uh, a diva. I mean, a, 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 a star. Yeah. So, um, and, and this might be good advice for some folks that are kind of feeling, stagnated in the developmental system because I was definitely there and I, I hope that they take this little story and they, they take it to heart because th this was my experience. So I got back, there was no spot waiting for me, but I knew I was an OVW. I was being paid to be a performer and an entertainer and to learn. That's what I was being paid to do. So I had to kind of like lean on that. And at the time they really wanted to push the women as like a garnish. Like we were supposed to be doing, you know, um, bikini best body contests and bikini mm -hmm. contests and all this stuff that was not my bag. And I'm like, uh, I'm just not feeling this guys. And so I decided we're going to do this. Like it, it we are going to own this. So mm -hmm. I kind of took a little bit of a ownership and leadership role and like, okay, if today we're doing a tug of war, we're going to make this, we're going to work this. We're going to tell a story just like a match. If today's thing is a pudding match, okay, whatever, we're going to work this and we're going to entertain that crowd. Cause I'm paid to be an entertainer. You know, I'm not paid to write the show. Then I would be a writer. You know what I mean? So um, I took that attitude. And then what happened was like, I feel like Danny Davis, Al Snow, Paul Heyman, they all started seeing us girls working our butts off and being game to do anything. And they eventually started giving us opportunities to like, eventually myself and Katie Lee, we had like a really big Christmas show, like an end of the year show. And we did a ladder match. And, at, and to my knowledge, it was like the first televised girls ladder match. I mean, I, I'm not a historian, but that's what fans have told me in feedback. I'm sure that it was done in some place else in the world at some point, but WWE style, that was like the first girls ladder match. And once that happened, mm -hmm. I think I started getting credit, real credibility as a wrestler. 
Um, but then what happened was the summer that they, they wanted to shake things up a bit. I would think it was 2007. And I had this idea for a character to call myself the Glamazon because yeah. I knew the girls had limited TV time and there was 10 other blondes that looked just like me. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to start wearing this headband and, and sew Glamazon on my butt. And at least there's a word that people might, if they only see me for 10 seconds on the screen, hopefully they'll remember that word and be like, oh, that's the blonde that wears the headband. Yeah. You know, the tiara. So, um, I came up on the main roster. I love Candace the story. Mc- I love the story where that came from. <laughs> Sex in the City, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I totally ganked I'm Sorry to interject there, but it's a great story. No, no, yeah. Well, I mean, we, we try to take popular cultural references, yeah. I think, yeah. and wrestling, make them wrestling, you know. And so um, I just thought that, too, like I was like, well, that's, that kind of makes me the hybrid diva and a wrestler. I'm a Glamazon. Yeah. I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, and it just felt like that would be a good moniker and a good brand for myself. It felt like it fit. And uh, at the time, Candace Michelle was champion. So they had taken this girl that was a Playboy model and um, she was a go daddy model. And Candace had such mm-hmm. a like passion to learn the business and to learn to wrestle that um, she had an opportunity to be women's champion. And she could have she could have really ridden the wave of her sexuality and not even pursued the wrestling side. But that's not the way she wanted to do it. She wanted to be like a Trish, like take take on the, the torch of trying to evolve as a competitor. And so I came up and I was supposed to rotate as an opponent for Candace. It was like me, Jillian, and um, I'm not sure who the third, I can't remember who the third lady wrestler was, but anyways, Jillian did a weekend and then I did a weekend and then another uh, lady wrestler did the third weekend. And then um, Candace and I, when we had the chance to work, um, William Regal got in the ring with us and he's like, mm-hmm. you know, why don't you try, you could try this, this, and this. And then we were like, yeah. And then what about this? And then we kind of had like a little brainstorming session and we went out that evening. It was Wildwood, New Jersey. I'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. And we went out that evening and we had this match where it was like Candace was in real jeopardy and she really sold and she really made me look dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so for I think for the first time in a little while, they were starting to see like, you know, we had been really inundated with a lot of that like bikini culture. And then we started to see these two girls. We saw, you know, a beautiful, you know, champion. You know, she was she came from um, modeling background. But I mean, she took a beating and got up and then beat this big bully. So like it really like um, after that weekend, everything changed. You know, I, I became I became the running mate for Candace and we went straight to South Africa on tour. My face was on a T-shirt. I had an action figure. It was like right immediately from that point forward. And then I had been lobbying to use the Glamazon name. And they're like, no, 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 that we can't do that. We can't do that. That's not we're not. It's not where we're going. And I'm like, OK. And then after that weekend with Candace, they're like, you're going to be the Glamazon. Yeah, we <laughs> love it. Had, yeah, we love it. And they had an outfit made yeah. for me. And I wrestled Candace on the pay-per-view and, you know, I ripped extensions out of her head accidentally. And it was like those became like really important moments for me in building my characters like a big baddie. And uh, so I'm I'm so grateful for so many of those girls that were giving of their bodies. Maria was so giving. Layla, Kelly Kelly, like a lot of those young ladies um, really worked hard to make me look dominant. Well, and uh, one thing it seems happened here and and you've heard this uh, we've heard this story basically a couple of few times of guys that you know somebody like even uh the rock and 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 steve austin who got to a point where they try and give them this character or direction and when they finally said you know what this ain't working for me and i'm just gonna go do what i think is right it sounds like that's what happened to you yeah. And, you know, I'll be honest. So when I when I first went to like my first tryout in like 2002, um, I was I was actually told, um, you know, we're looking for another Trish. Trish is the template. Trish is the gold standard. Mm-hmm. If you're not Trish, you know, you got to work on being Trish. And I'm like, OK, OK, I can do this. I can be Trish. I can figure this out. And for years I tried, especially like in OVW, like I said, with like the makeup and you know, um, the push up bras and just like trying to squash myself into this mold that really wasn't me. There'll never be another Trish. Trish is Trish. And there she's, she's Trish for a reason. And once I started, I, once I gave that up and I was like, 
you know, for lack of a better term, F it, you know, I was like, I'm just going to be me. The second I was me against Candace and I just did what felt right for me, it was like off to the races. And I I tell this story like, like the previous story, because I just, I, I feel for people that are trying to find their footing, especially at the developmental level, like, and, you know, and, and starting of their career. And if the quicker you can find yourself and own yourself, that's where the money is. That's where the yeah. confidence is. And that's what reads to the audience. Well, and it got to the point now where, where you talked when you decided to leave that, uh, you know, it wasn't happening for the divas. But was there a period of time that you felt that you were really uh, having an impact at, at changing how women were, were perceived in the WWE? Yeah, for sure. So my work with Santino Morella, we had like a comedy act for almost Yeah, the Glamorella. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we had yeah. this great dynamic and he was wonderful. And what he did yeah. was he he made himself indispensable as such a, a an entertaining part of the show, but he also yeah. elevated me as like this dangerous female because he would always act, you know, he he acted enamored with me but always a little yeah. afraid of me. So he he just validated, you know, this character for me and, and did it for so long. And he was such an entertaining part of the show that I got so much eyes on myself because of what he did. So mm-hmm. it is not lost on me how much Santino did for my career. Um, and then I would say um, being a part of the men's Royal Rumble, you know, there's been, yeah. I had, there were so many moments in my career that um, were meaningful to me personally but I felt like, you know, China was such a huge influence on me and, and being that like mold breaking female that was just like nothing like I'd ever seen before and such an inspiration to get in the gym that like seeing, um, you know, getting that opportunity to, to basically walk in the, the road she paved for me was like just, I was on cloud nine. Like I'll never forget. I, um, I ran, to, I sprinted to the ring for my moment when my, you know, number hit. And then after I was eliminated, it came to the back. I, I ran into Undertaker and he said, he said, you might have broke a world record with that sprint. Like, and, <laughs> and it was, we just had a little chuckle because like I, I, I wouldn't have even, it wasn't on purpose. I wasn't like trying to get to the ring fast. I was just so amped up. My head could explode. Like it was just, yeah. it was one of those surreal moments and it was literally, you could have blinked and missed it. But for me, it was such a vindication for everything that I had wanted to do to be recognized, not as like, Oh, she's a good, she's good for a girl. She's a good wrestler as a girl. She's a good, I wanted to be, you're a good wrestler. You are, you were great at what you did, not you were great at what you did for a girl. You know what I mean? Like, so that, that was like, for me, like that was winning the Olympics. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also, uh, I think was it Kali that you tossed, uh, you tossed out a, I mean, did they say we're going to make this a big impact? It's going to be, even though you'll you'll, you'll be eliminated, but uh, was that part of it to for you to do that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, I again, I think they wanted to build the Royal Rumble is uh, is by far my favorite match of the year, yeah, and it's because uh, there's so many mini stories within this grandiose story. You know, there's always a thread, a big story arc, and in between we have all of these moments of excitement and surprises. That's the biggest thing is the surprise. And, you know, I think having me come, like the real meat and potatoes of my entire moment in the Royal Rumble was me standing face to face with Kali Mm -hmm. because it's like, who does this woman think she is? You know what I mean? Like I was, I was defiant against gender in that moment. And, um, and that was more important than eliminating anybody or doing anything. It was like I said, it was what China started and yeah. I got an opportunity to further that by being defiant and standing face to face with a man and saying like, uh, uh, the giant. Yeah. 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 I'm not yeah. afraid of you. So yeah. it was That's pretty awesome. Cool. <laughs> yeah. And you, and you mentioned it though with, with China that she was, you were the second. She was the first to, to, uh, be part of a Royal Rumble. Did you ever have, to have an opportunity to meet with her or have any kind of relationship? I didn't. I didn't. Really? I, yeah. you know, I, um, at the time that I was a heel, I, I always regretted this, but I mean, this was the entertainment business, right? I didn't have any, again, yeah. this was like pre Twitter DMs and all that stuff. Like before, um, you know, now we can, we can DM our favorite celebrities, you know what I mean? If they follow yeah. us, right. but, um, but now, but back then, you know, I just didn't have any, I didn't have any connections to her. Yeah. And at the time, um, I had done an interview as, and I was being a heel. And, you know, I think in the interview, I said something to the effect of, uh, 
oh, you know, I'm better than China ever was or something like that. I, right, you know, right. I, I was just being a heel yeah. and I don't know if that ever like just kind of landed poorly on her or what, but I, I am sad that I didn't get the chance to tell her face to face, um, how much she influenced me because she did, she did so much for us as a, as the, you know, women's division. Yeah, and uh, Beth, with that in mind of, uh, you know, the inroads and the, and the battle it really was a battle along the way to, for, uh, a place on that stage in the WWE. And I don't know, you know, you couldn't do it overnight because, uh, that's the way Vince operates that company. But did you feel that little by little though, that you were, uh, as a group, uh, yourself included, of course, um, as divas that you were starting to really make an impact? It wasn't, you know, when I was there, it was a sideshow in, in many cases. And I give credit, I, I've mentioned it many, many times because I work with Sherry, that she was one of those people that crossed over and did a lot for women that followed her because she could go out there and take a beating from a man. Um, and, and like I said, you, could, you can't do, couldn't do these things overnight, but did you feel that you had picked up that torch? Yeah, I, tr- I certainly tried. I think that my niche in WWE mm-hmm. was... Um, definitely having like I could tell stories in matches. So I, so during my career, WB trusted me to be on a lot of pay-per-views and a lot of pay-per-view championship matches because I was pretty good at hitting my times. I was, I was good when it came to, you could rely on me on my, on hitting my times. And then also I, I could tell a story in the match And um, also, like, you know, when we did that on live events, I loved doing live events and working for the in-house crowd. No pressure. It was always just a great, relaxed environment. Um, But, you know, for those big pay-per-views, I felt like I I I was pretty good at rising to the occasion. And also, I, I think I could make my opponent, which was really the name of the game, because it didn't do anyone any good to have one girl that was perceived as a wrestler and five girls that were perceived as models. That doesn't mm-hmm. do any, that, that, there's no drama in that. It's like, ah, uh, okay, yeah. you know, it's the same old thing. I want to see, you know, the, maybe the one girl that's the stronger wrestler, but then I've got five girls that are contenders. And it was my job, you know, it, no matter who was on the other side of the ring, to, to make you believe that that person was a contender. And that's really the magic of our business is like you want to believe that at any moment anybody could, you know, it could go either way. There's no drama if I know it's going to be a slaughter. You know what right. I mean? Right. So so that that was part of the illusion and um, part of my job as uh, as and I think that I did that with consistency and with consistency, the company begins to trust you and mm-hmm. they can rely on you. They can you know, they can they know they can go to you if they have something you know, specific tasks they have in mind. Yeah. Well, and uh, you did it all. We could list all the things you accomplished here, all these great people that you, you faced and, uh, you know, a diva champion, a divas champion and all that. Um, but what was it along the road here? Is it be, you got closer to, to 2011, 2012 there that, that started to, uh, I don't know, start to, be a thought in your mind that, you know, I, I, I think that it's time that I need to at least take a break here. What's, what started to happen? Yeah. I, I mean, like I said, for me, I had lost, we had three funerals in a very short amount of time. Yeah. I, right. I, I was wrestling, um, TLC that ladder, or excuse me, that tables match against lay cool with Natty, you know, while my grandfather was being buried and, uh, you know, I was, we were having a pay-per-view match. And so, you know, there had been, I'd missed so many birthdays. I'd missed yeah. so many, you know, over the years because, you know, working in the Indies and living in Kentucky. And I just, I gave 10, 12 years of my life to wrestling. And, um, and I just, you know, and like I said, I had met Adam and we had contemplated starting a family. So it was just, there was like, I felt like I had really accomplished what I had wanted to in wrestling. I really tried to give back at the end there, especially, you know, to those that were so giving to me. And I mm-hmm. hoped that, and I, I hoped that what I had did, what I had done would be remembered. But if it, if it wasn't, I knew in my heart, I was really satisfied with what I had done. Even if, even if it never amounted to anything and I was never remembered or, or acknowledged again, in my heart, I felt, um, that I did it. And so I had a lot of peace surrounding that. And I also, I wanted to have children. You know, I, lo- I love my life as a mom and I love my children. And I, I was ready for that in, in my life. And what was happening though with the, with the 
divas at that time that you felt that it was, uh, you know, I, it, it, I guess it had started to uh, wane a bit that they weren't as accomplishing as much or what was, what was it with the division itself with the divas that so the, the, uh, disheartened you? Um, it was just like, there was a couple instances where I had, you know, we were just feeling like our time was getting cut and cut and, yeah. um, you know, oh, this, the same stuff we'd always struggled with, but I just had, I had just gotten heartbroken about it. I don't know how else to describe it. I was yeah. just really, really, um, sad that like, I was like, I'm, all of us can do better. All of us can do more. Why, why aren't we given that? But, mm-hmm. but I, I will say almost, uh, you know, just around the corner after I left and, and had my first child, just around the corner, the, there was a, kind of like a rebellion from the crowd. And um, the girls did a great job of spearheading this. And the crowd was, they got a hashtag trending, which was give divas a chance. Um, I know like AJ Lee had a lot to do with that. Nikki Bella, it was like, it was just kind of a, an era where the girls were starting to show a little bit of ire about this. And the crowd was responding and saying, like, you know, we're not all here just for sexual reasons. You know what I mean? Like, there mm-hmm. there are brothers. Yeah. There are dads out there. There are grandfathers. You know, we're not all here to oogle women. Like, they want to see they want to see female superheroes, too. And they might have daughters or sisters or even their moms, you know, and want them to have women to look up to and to, to see in a yeah. positive light, you know. And I think the crowd was just ready for it. We were seeing, like, this kind of, like, break in the way we're just ready. You know, the world culturally was kind of ready to see women start emerging in these more powerful superhero um, role models sort of roles. And um, so that was great. And that kind of started a little bit of a movement. They started hiring women with more wrestling experience. Yeah. Um, and then fast forward a few years and we have a tournament like the May Young Classic, which yeah brought in, you know, what, 32 girls from independence, you know, all over the world internationally. And um, we're just seeing like, we just had women, three women main event WrestleMania this year. Um, we're seeing this like, this equal star power with even with merchandise. When I was working as a wrestler, the women didn't have merchandise because it didn't sell. Yeah. And it, it didn't sell because we weren't promoted in a way. We weren't promoted the same as the men. Now the women's merchandise sells. And I look out in the crowd and I see men, women, children, old, young, all wearing, you know, the man, Becky Lynn shirts. And it just goes to show you now that we're all kind of on the same page. We have come to a point now as a division where I, I totally feel like the women's matches are of equal quality and interest to the men's and it's taken a long time to get here, but I am so, so proud of the girls today for what they've done and continue to do. Yeah. Well, and, and you can say what you want. It, it is certainly right to say that, you know, uh, the women have every much a right to, to be out there as the men, but we all know what it really, for Vince McMahon, it comes down, it's business and that company, it's business. If it, if it's, if it sells, then they put it out there. And obviously that is working uh, because Look at what the, I mean, you're right. They have, uh, they have equal footing in many cases and they're making, uh, you know, uh, these tours that they're doing. And I'm, I'm sure it won't be too long before we're going to see one in, over in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, you know, over the, you know, the, to show just what, how far they've come. But, uh, what do you think though that really did it? Like you said, it, it was just time that people realized because it's, it's all about entertainment. It's got to be more than a political movement. So uh, was, was it a combination of both because yeah. the, the quality? Uh, yeah, I think, well, like also, like I said, they have they've reached out and they've started um, cultivating these different types of athletes as well. Yeah. So we're, we're not just hiring um, people truly. And this goes for the men as well. This is not I, I'm making this sound like it's very gender heavy toward the women because that's my wheelhouse. However, it's the this is the same for the men as well. They are looking at athletes now, not just aesthetics. We are mm-hmm. looking at, you know, CrossFitters and NFL players and, yeah. you know, NCAA champion wrestlers. We're hiring these athletes that have these innate abilities and charisma um, and and are, you know, more than just a magazine picture. And so I think you're getting this crop of young talent that are just capable of so much. 
And, you know, this is nothing, this says nothing about previous generations because it was a different product before we were catering, we were selling something different in the past. Mm -hmm. Um, But now we're, now what we're selling is like athleticism, top to bottom and charisma, you know, and it's just, it's a very different vibe for the product. It's really hip and and I love it. And um, yeah. And I think that, um, I think that culturally you've got like, you know, female leads in superhero movies. We've got Wonder Woman. We've got Captain Marvel. You know, we're seeing action figures. Little girls and little boys are playing with Captain Marvel action figures. You know, mm-hmm. we're seeing, um, you know, not just changes in media, but we we had the Me Too movement kind of sweep through and start creating accountability for treating, you know, not uh, for avoiding sexual harassment and making sure that like we as a culture do better. So I think like I think that just that vibe in our in our world today has kind of come and WWE is usually at the forefront of these. Um, they're ahead of the curve. Let's put it that way. Yeah. You know, when it came to technology, our WWE network, we you know, at the time, I remember when they started introducing that idea that everyone's like, ah, that will never work. You know, what I mean, like that. I don't know about that. That's really sketchy. That's weird. And now, look, that's how all entertainment is streaming now. Like we're all going towards streaming and cables starting to become affected by that. So yeah. it's like, you know, WWE is ahead of the curve. And I think featuring the women, it was definitely time. And, you know, having a girl like Ronda Rousey come in, I mean, she was such a natural fit because she mm-hmm. did the exact same thing in UFC. She really changed perception and became the number one draw in, in UFC. So like the, we just saw like in sports, you have like a Serena Williams, you know, these really powerful role models, um, females coming to the forefront and just kind of setting these amazing examples, even like a Mich- Michelle Obama. You know what I mean? We were just seeing more women um, featured and speaking up. And so it just seems like a natural organic thing for that to happen in our sports entertainment business. And what about uh, uh, salaries? Uh as far as the women, have they come a long way and are they getting closer or is there still a huge gap? I think that, I think that the salaries are evolving for sure. And I don't know, I don't see people's contracts, obviously, right. so I don't yeah. know for sure. I do know what I was paid and I do know what young ladies, what I've been told some folks are getting paid. And I think it has definitely improved, definitely yeah. improved. And it's, it's definitely going to be continuing the right direction until we're at an equal pay situation. Like I said, I don't know what everybody bakes, so I can't speak on if it is equal at this point or not. However, I do know it's better from when I was there. Yeah. All right. Well, Beth, uh, really, uh, it's awesome to see you back out there. And I know folks are loving it. And uh, I, I, I hope we meet in person sometime soon. Yes, that would be so awesome, Sean. And Adam sends his best. Thank you so much for the opportunity to tell some stories. And I hope I didn't bore you to death. <laughs> no, I loved it. I loved every second. And uh, w- quickly, how can uh, our listeners uh, get a message to you? Or do you have a, a site or a Twitter? Uh, what do you want to how, yeah. how can they get a hold of you? I'm on Twitter and Instagram. It's my handle's the same for both. It's at the Beth Phoenix. And okay. you Feel free to send me a message there. I check it all the time. <laughs> awesome. All right, you guys take care. And I, I like I said, I hope I, I hope I see you guys down the road. Yeah. Do my best to Adam. Same to you, Sean. We'll talk to you soon.